one way of getting at the moral nub of why genetic engineering for enhancement is different from curing disease. In many ways, there is a precedent for it. And that precedent we saw through much of the first half of the 20th century, and its name was eugenics. Now, we think of eugenics, uh, uh, we, we associate Hitler and well, Nazis. because the Nazis gave it a bad name, but Teddy Roosevelt believed in it. He did. Oliver Wendell Holmes believed That's in right. it. That's right. Margaret Sanger believed That's in it. That's right. So what's the matter with it? Well, it was an attempt. It was an attempt, part of a progressive movement of social reform in Britain and America, especially before, it, before the Nuremberg Laws. Um, to try to improve the germplasm, to elevate humanity, to, to weed out imbeciles and mental incompetence, to improve humanity. It was, it was to our, most of us would say perverse, but it was still, it was an idealistic venture. So what, one way of posing the question, uh, framing the question we're discussing is, what was wrong with eugenics? Now, one thing that was wrong was the coercion. And nowadays, we're tempted to think, well, some people would say that's all that was wrong. Well, if just you just leave it to a free market. Right. What, we have, what we're talking about now with, design, with genetic engineering to enhance children is essentially, it's not state mandated, it's not coercive. So it's eugenics minus the coercion. It's really free market eugenics or privatized eugenics. That's what we're talking about. And the question is, is it still, minus the coercion, morally troubling? And I think that it is. Consider this low-tech analogy. So after the Nazis gave eugenics a bad name, it went into dis, kind of disrepute. But then in the 1980s, there was a, an eccentric eugenicist philanthropist who started up one of the first sperm banks. It was not a commercial for-profit sperm bank. It had a philanthropic eugenic purpose to improve humanity. And it was called the Repository for Germinal Choice. <laughs> and what this, what this guy did was he, he was going to set up a sperm bank with the sperm of Nobel Prize winning scientists. And to make it available to women who would then, he thought, have super smart babies. Now, it was not a big success. He had trouble recruiting very many of the <laughs> scientists. In fact, my, I don't think my friend Jim Watson contributed. <laughs> but uh, I think he only got one, and that was Shockley, the notorious racist. Wow. From, uh, and so he well, had... One of the problems is they were too old and their sperm didn't qualify. Well, that was, <laughs> that's actually what the, the, the guy said in retrospect, though some said it was sour grapes, not to mix a metaphor. That, <laughs> and so he settled, he settled for, for young scientists of high promise. But the thing... All right, now we would all agree. Now that was not coercive. No one was required. Purely voluntary. That... But it was still recognizably eugenic, we would agree, even minus the coercion. Now, that's, that place has gone out of business, but today there is a very successful industry of, uh, of sperm banks, commercial sperm banks. There's one of them, Cryobank it's called, and they have their offices and, and they advertise for donors. You know, in Ivy League newspapers, they, they have one of their offices uh, near Stanford and one of them between Harvard and MIT. And in their donor catalog and on their website, they advertise Ivy League sperm. But isn't that illegal? Now, now, that, well, may, now, that, now, that's purely commercial. It's non-coercive. It has no explicit eugenic right. aim. But it's eugenic and objectionable, is I would say, in just the, the same way. Is that different from the Ivy League dating service? <laughs> <laughs> As you well know, there's an Ivy League dating service, which you could look at. Well, I, haven't, I haven't looked, in, I haven't Michael, looked Michael, into it say, myself. I don't, but Michael, I'm not that's one, with. one of your own sons. Let's say he, at some point, is yeah. looking to you for advice, and yeah. he, it, sadly, uh, wife is not fertile, and they're going to choose an egg somewhere. You're going to say, the moral thing for you to do is make a random choice, and you should not be asking about intelligence, appearance, color, anything else. That that is, you know, morally inappropriate. 
You, We're you, not talking about disease. Uh, yeah, put it's, aside it, it, put screen. Put aside disease. Right. Put aside disease. Well, so I, I hope I object to the donor catalogs, and so I hope I would be able to say to him, uh, ideally, uh, no, you should not shop in the consumer catalog of the sperm donor catalog. And that goes catalog. for the question I asked earlier about race. Well, I would include I would include that too. Now you could so press you would you you'd make all entries. Uh, neutral with regard to any characteristic. Look, they don't list the father, which is interesting. And now there's a big debate about whether the donor, I mean the, the father, biological father. So they do screen out that information and don't make it available. Right. So there's no reason in principle why they couldn't also screen out other consumer-driven information. Now I'm putting aside medical information. Right. And I think, now, the reason it, that, that issue of the sperm donor catalog, it's illustrative. It doesn't have the same kind of moral urgency that the general practice of designer children does have because it's a relatively small part of how parents come to have children. But if it became, if shopping in that sperm donor catalog became the norm, became the characteristic way that parents thought about children, and began to spill over into the general practice of parenting as it now can increasingly with genetic engineering and screening, then I think we should, uh, we should very seriously consider uh, alternatives to that. And by the way, these sperm banks and these fertility clinics, they are in the United States completely unregulated. There are more government regulations and licenses required for my barber or yours than for these for-profit fertility clinics that are experimenting in the frontier. Think, what would make you think that that would become the norm? I remember when IVF was not permitted in this country, and people had imaginings of what abuses would be. Today, of course, it's allowed, and most of the abuses that I can think of that people imagined have not come true. It seems as if well, IVF, sperm, I'm all for IVF. And, and sperm I'm for that. And, and, and the use of sperm banks is unlikely, because they've been around for a while, to become a dominant. No, I'm all for sperm banks, right. too. Right. I'm only questioning the consumer-driven commodification aspect, where you pick and choose non-medical genetic yeah. traits. I, I just but think, Elliot, though, there's you, a certain, na certain naivete, though, about whether we na can control... No, I would never say you're naive, Michael. <laughs> no, about whether this is truly controllable. Again, I mean, if there is a drug that's going to be... I mean, for, I mean, talk about longevity. Let's say we, that Bill identifies a, a gene that, that, that reverses the effects of aging. I mean, ever since the Egyptians through right. the Greeks and Ponce de Leon and today's cosmetic companies, we've been seeking eternal life. And the appeal of many religions is right. released on that. What if that became something available? Right. And, and, you know, human life could go on to 150, 200 years old. Right. And we have that capability. Would you regulate against it? You because know, you, somehow you, it's you're asking a very interesting question from a, a researcher who is deeply interested in life extension. I'm interested in that topic. Uh, we look and are con increasingly defining aging as a series of treatable diseases. That's more or less a construct that has been created over the last 20 years. It used to be aging was uniform and, and inevitable, and now we look at discrete components of it, heart disease, neurological disease, Bone disease. But there's some and nemat nematodes or something that if you actually make a... Okay, but, but, the, the, but where we are reconstructing our fundamental notion of aging in such a way that it is becoming a medical issue. If we define the goal of medicine is to solve medical problems, aging can be defined that way. And then you reach a difficulty because that is a qualitative change in human existence. If we go beyond our allotted 120-year maximum through our understanding and alteration of the process, and we do it because we believe we are providing a healthier life for people, which we should be doing, we then, I think, get into a more difficult
What about aging uh, issues for you? Mike? Well, uh, before we get to that, I want to uh, I, I want to take a crack at the question which you've asked from a, a number of different angles, and it's a, a very important question. Even if all of these moral and ethical concerns are valid and persuasive, you say, Elliot, uh, isn't it just whistling in the wind? Isn't it inevitable that we will be carried along? Whatever biotechnology makes possible, we will use. And right, no, That's I'm going to that no, but I'm going to chat. I have an answer for that, and, for, and the answer is this: uh, when the atom, when atomic energy was unleashed, people said, and maybe they were right, the same thing: you're never going to be able to get the genie back in the bottle. Once the atomic weapons exist, uh, no, no, uh, there's no hope in regulating them. Eventually, whatever nation has the ability, the scientists, the resources to develop a nuclear weapon, they will do it. Well, I hope you're right, but it's only been 50 years.